Take your Bibles, and we're going to go to Genesis now, and uh, Genesis chapter 4. That's not hard to find. It's probably about the fourth page in your Bible. So uh, right there at the very beginning, if you need a Bible, wave at one of the ushers that are coming, and they'll be glad to let you borrow one, or you can keep it. It's our gift to you if you don't have a Bible. Genesis chapter 4 is where we're going. While you're turning there, I wonder if you remember if you remember the story <clears throat> of the musician from several hundred years ago. His name was Antonio Salieri. He was the court musician in Vienna, and he wrote melodies that were beautiful and choral pieces that were lovely and instrumental works that were impressive. And he uh, was a devout Christian, and he knew that God had put gifts and talents inside of him, and be, therefore, he, he wanted to serve God with those gifts. And he prayed, Lord, just make my music glorifying for you. Let my music just lift people's hearts to you, Lord. Let me just serve you through the gifts that you've given me musically. And he gave us all to doing just that, Salieri did. And then one day, along came a young man they called Mozart. He was a child prodigy, dazzled the crowds, playing music like it was just second nature, fingers dancing across the keyboard, just laughing. It was so fun and effortless for him. Melodies that just soared in such a way that it seemed to grab heaven and just pull it right down to where people were here on earth. He was a musical boy wonder. But Mozart, unlike Salieri, was not a devout person. No, no. He was vulgar. He was obscene. He was an immature womanizer. And Salieri watched him. And the more he watched, the more green with envy he grew. Salieri, he figured, I'm a servant of God. Why should Mozart get blessed with all of those abilities? Salieri thought to himself, I've lived the life of piousness and obedience, following close with the Lord. And, and why can Mozart traffic in all of these worldly pleasures and he just moves to the front of the pack? And Salieri was one who had spent his lifetime working hard on his craft. Why could it come so easily to Mozart without even trying? And then Mozart for reasons they still don't know, mysteriously died at the very young age of 35. And in the dramatic final scene of the film they made several decades ago called, uh, ago called Amadeus, the camera trains in on Salieri, who's green with envy still, even though he lived 30 years beyond Mozart, never could get over it. And there the camera pictures him in the insane asylum, cursing God for why he had given to Mozart all of those blessings. Envy is the subject of the day. You know, we started a series last week on the remedies to seven deadly sins. And just did a little overviewing about the list of the seven deadly sins. If you weren't here, I'll just briefly summarize, and you can listen in from last week about the one that we took last week. But I, I mentioned to you that the seven deadly sins is not a list that you'll look up in the back of your Bible. You're not like, where's the seven deadly sins? That's not a clustering that comes in Scripture. Now, all seven of the sins are certainly talked about throughout Scripture, but they weren't clustered together or stitched together in one list until the Middle Ages, when some theologians came along seeking to pinpoint the attitudes and character traits that are most detrimental to a person's relationship with God. And ever since then, they were considered the headwaters of sin, out of which come the trickles and the flows and the gushes of the rivers of all sin. If you go back up to the headwaters, you find these seven, and subsequently they're called the head sins or the capital sins, or the first sins. So back to envy. What exactly is envy, this one that we're looking at today? It's a condition that poisons us and makes us incapable of enjoying whatever is in front of us. Envy is wanting somebody else's life. 
You see that they have something better than you have. And instead of rejoicing with the good thing that has come to them, you weep over the fact that you don't have it. It's like a beast that lurks deep within our soul. And it doesn't take much for that beast to get activated. Especially in our days of social media. I mean, that's just only exacerbating the problem of envy nowadays. There's career envy and kitchen envy, children envy, food envy, figure envy, bicep envy, <laughs> holiday envy. It comes in every shape, form, size, and flavor you could imagine. And if you look in your heart, I bet that you might find a little bit of it. And if you don't believe that you have any envy, you must keep this in mind as well. With credit to Tim Keller, who gave me several key thoughts about this message. You have to keep in mind that envy works in reverse as well. In other words, when people who are above you or have more than you or something that you don't have, when they fall down, you like that. That's envy too, that's envy in reverse. Happy at people's unhappiness. So in chapter four of Genesis, you have the first clear example of envy. You remember Adam and Eve had two sons at first, Cain and Abel. And you just picture them playing along and enjoying the friendship and the fellowship they had with one another, like brothers just do, building their forts, playing in the dirt, carving their initials in the trees, swimming in the new Euphrates River that was pollution-free, running races with the animals and running races against each other. They were brothers, they were friends, they were competitors. And their parents, Adam and Eve, had taught them how to worship God, and how to build their altars and make their sacrifices to God. And so then one day in chapter four, both come to worship. Each built his own altar. Each prayed his prayers. And each offered his praise and thanks up to God. After which God says, Abel, good work. That was a good sacrifice. That was a good offering, pleasing to me. Cain, not so good. And in that moment, the beast of envy came lurking out from the darkness and bit Cain's heart and the poison surged through his system and his eyes turned dark with green. And the next day, the perceived winner had become the loser and the perceived loser had given into the beast as if nobody was going to notice. I'll just bury him and we'll just go on. Nobody will even hardly miss him. The first murder was a fratricide, and it was due to envy between the two brothers. I mentioned that to say simply this, envy, therefore, you can see, is nothing new at all. It's been with us <laughs> since the beginning. Now, rather than take you through the whole text in the interest of time, I just summarized chapter four for us. But I do want to guide your eyes to two verses in particular. These are the key verses in chapter four, so you could underline them. Verses six and verses seven. Let me read to you uh, verses six and verses seven. Verse six, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you. And so you must rule over it, Cain. I've always wondered, why was Abel's offering acceptable to God and Cain's was not? We had a family debate about it yesterday and it was interesting 
At the end, though, we had to agree. Scholars who've studied these things, theologians, have never been able to arrive at just one explanation. The text doesn't make it abundantly clear. As a matter of fact, there's four theories as to why Abel's offering was pleasing and Cain's wasn't. But I don't want to meander down those four paths because doing so would be to miss the point of of really what we're studying today. The point is this, Cain knew what was wrong with his offering. Cain knew, but rather than change what needed to be changed, whether it was the content of the offering because he hadn't offered the right thing or the condition of his heart because his heart wasn't right before God as he was offering what he was offering or a mix of both, we don't know. But what we do know is envy got the best of him and it gets the best of you and me as well. You say, well, I would never murder somebody. Good heavens. Uh, Envy, I might feel it here and there, but I'd never kill somebody. Well, you know, the reality is you can murder somebody's reputation just pretty easily. You can murder their character. You can murder their confidence, all with a subtle smile on your face and the slight shrug of the shoulders. It's not that hard. And so we have to deal with this sin of envy. Three reasons, really. If you're a note taker, here's the first of those reasons. We have to deal with envy. Left unchecked, envy will depress you. You have to deal with it because if you don't, you'll end up depressed. Every time envy poisons your ability to live your life well. And it causes comparison on steroids that some call comparisonitis. And here's how you know that you've moved into the clutches of envy because nothing's ever good enough for you. Your job isn't good enough. Your body's not good enough. Your friendships aren't good enough. Your marriage isn't good enough. Your car isn't good enough. Your life isn't good enough. Nothing's good enough. You're always finding faults. You're always critical. You can never just sit down and enjoy the moment. You can't sit down and enjoy what God has put in front of you. There's always something wrong because you're always comparing yourself to somebody else. If you're a musician, you envy the musician who's written more and popular and better selling songs than you have. If you're a teacher, you'll envy the teacher down the hall who seems more popular and more sought out by the students than you. If you're an athlete, you'll envy the the athlete who's a little faster or a little stronger than you. If you don't like the way you look, I bet it's not because you're comparing yourself to someone who looks homelier than you. No, no, you're doing what the evil queen in Snow White did, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them? You're comparing yourself to someone who's probably younger and perhaps more beautiful. With the advent of social media, envy, like I said, it's really gotten on steroids. Ethan Cross is a psychology professor I was reading about in the University of Michigan. He designed a study tracking the relationship between passive social media. He calls it voyeuristically scrolling. You're not really doing anything for a purpose other than you're just reading in and looking in on everybody else's feed. He says, I wanted to track, what does that do to the mood? Participants received five texts per day for two weeks, asking about their passive social use. Over the course of the hours in each day, he would ask, how much have you been using it? How much have you been looking? And he would ask them to grade their overall sense of feeling, well-being, about life and the results were striking because the more minutes spent just scrolling away, the more envy they registered in the survey, which in turn always tracked with a higher sense, or I guess I should say with a diminishing sense of well-being. 
with a lower sense of well-being. You watch more of it, you look at more of it, you voyeuristically scroll through others longer, and you feel worse about yourself. Of course, because you're comparing more. And envy, it's no respecter of age. You're not even out, you never outgrow it. Our expression of green with envy. It denotes historically that envy was personified as a sickly person. Because there's some sins that, well, they make other people feel, feel ill. But envy, it makes you, the host, feel ill. It'll depress you. The leaders of Florence, Italy, years ago, asked Leonardo da Vinci, then Italy's leading artist, to submit sketches for the decorations on the Grand Hall of Florence. And da Vinci's sketches were superb in keeping with his genius. But one of the city's leaders had heard about a little-known artist who was coming along. His name was Michelangelo. Asked him to submit some sketches as well. And when they saw the sketches of Michelangelo, there was a spontaneous expression of wonder and enthusiasm. And news of this got to Leonardo, and particularly news about one of them having said, well, you know Leonardo, he's getting a bit old. And they say he was never able to shake that feeling. He could never get over the eclipse of his fame by Michelangelo. And the remaining years of his life were clouded with doom and sorrow. And that's what envy does to us. It'll depress you. That's the first thing. And the second thing is it will possess you. It will depress you. And then it will consume you. And that's what I mean when I say possess. I mean it will consume your every thought. And none of us is exempt from this. If you were here five or six years ago, you know I told this story, and I'll tell it again. Though it's terribly embarrassing. I hate this series because I have to tell all my bad sins. <laughs> to illustrate it, to make it work. But I moved here to start the church as a young man, having graduated with my bachelor's from Vanderbilt and my master's and my doctorate from Asbury Seminary. And in my 20s, I had, uh, well, I'd made a bit of a name for myself through my preaching gift. I'd won some preaching awards at seminary and I was getting nice invitations here and there. And so I figured when God called me to start the new church here, uh, that it was all gonna rise and fall on my preaching gifts. And, <clears throat> I just figured, well, that just makes sense. That's why he's given me those gifts anyhow. And we weren't just but two or three or four months into this journey, this adventure of starting the church before my friend, a pastor in Austin, his name's Matt Carter, called me and he said, hey, there's a guy who's coming your way and he's just gonna graduate here in a week or two and you should hire him. I'm telling you, he's really, really good. So I called him up and we got to know each other and I ended up hiring him for a pittance of a salary, but he took the job because he had no money. Well, I had no money really either, <laughs> so we were even. And he needed a job, <clears throat> and I needed someone to help me. His name was Ben <laughs> Stewart. I bet you've heard of him. And after he'd been here a couple of months, I said, hey, why didn't you preach on a Sunday? I figured, well, it'll just give me a chance to hear what you've got, you know, and afterwards, I was like, wow, Ben, I think God may have put a gift of preaching inside of you. That was really good. You haven't even been to seminary. But I know everybody can have beginner's luck. I figured, well, lightning can't strike twice. <laughs> but let's try it. And so I put him up again, and he crushed it again. And I was thrilled Genuinely, I felt like a dad so proud because he was watching his son throw a touchdown pass. It was just, I was thrilled to think, wow, God, you really brought me somebody that's very, very good. This is awesome. And over time, I noticed that after the early service over at the Cleb Intermediate School in the cafetorium, 
uh, that the parents of the youth, they would go into the choir room, standing room only, they'd hug the walls of the choir room where their kids were for their youth service, and they'd go in to hear a second service sermon. But I figured, well, you're just doing that because you, well, the boy needs support, and your kids, you can't leave until they're done, so you're just enduring a second sermon. Until one day a lady came out, and she said to me, Ken, you did really well today. That was good, but I'm telling you, you need to get a recording of what Ben just preached down there. Now that (laughs) was amazing. (laughs) And I'm thinking, you did not need to say that. (laughs) Sometimes you should just think it, don't say it. (laughs) And honestly, I was thinking, why do, you, why do you endure two sermons? Nobody needs two sermons in one day. One is enough. Your cup raneth over when I was done. You didn't need to go and endure a second sermon for crying out loud. I was putting in my hardest work, and yet this young man was starting to steal my thunder. And just like that, The mention of his name didn't make me so happy anymore. Now it made me feel frustrated. And then one night in the privacy of the third floor apartment where I lived as a single guy back then, I was lying on the bed, I remember, when the thought crossed my mind, I really need to help Ben move on. I need to give him a graceful exit ramp and help him feel freed up for his future. I thought that I was all alone. Unbeknownst to me, the spirit of the Lord had come into that room, totally uninvited. (laughs) And just as clear as I'm standing here looking at you right now, I could see in my mind's eye that scene in the Old Testament where King Saul can stand no longer putting up, tolerating any of young David who was going to succeed him. And he took his spear and he threw it at David while David was playing the harp for him. And I sense the whisper of the Holy Spirit say to my spirit, even in that moment, are you going to be like Saul and throw spears at young Ben and get rid of him? Or you're going to humble yourself and love him like Saul's son, Jonathan. Love David. Lifting him up, encouraging him, friending, befriending him, mentoring him and being for him like a brother or a father that he didn't have. And I remembered in that spear-throwing incident where Saul threw his spear at David After that, God's hand never again rested on Saul with blessing. Oh, I'm telling you, that was the night I was wrestling. I was trying every way to slither my way out of the headlock that I knew God had me in because I had a script. I wanted that script to be the script that counted. I wanted to be the star. And the Lord landed another punch right then. And I sensed him say to my spirit, the trajectory of your ministry will be marked from this day forward by the choice you make tonight. Will you be Saul or will you be David? Or will you be Jonathan? By this point, I was crying really because I was mad. I was mad because I hadn't even invited God over that evening. I just wanted to be alone and have my own thoughts. I was mad because God was forming in me the reality of what I was becoming and was casting for me a vision of something new that I hadn't signed up for. And I was mad because I knew I had to do what he wanted me to do and I was crying and sitting there pouting and but after a while I noticed something was happening my tears turned warm from cold and there was a cleansing in my spirit 
as he was working in my heart to get that gunk out as I began repenting. And this cleansing, I don't know, it just sort of came over me, this sense of washing. And, and it was as if the tentacles of that beast of envy were getting pried open from clutching my heart. And in the moments that followed, God gave me a new vision, a new script, a new narrative, a new story for my life. Not anymore was it going to be, this will be the church that was built on Ken's preaching gift, but he gave me what I call my balcony vision, the whole concept that I would move to the balcony and that I would work the rest of my life to grow fruit on the trees of other people through their gifts and through their talents and through their abilities, which I would nurture and foster and mentor and help develop. It was a brand new vision for me. And ever since that night, I have been able to celebrate every good thing that God has brought to Ben. And now Donna and their children, the new church up in D.C. now, and I count him it's one of my dearest, most dependable, trustworthy confidants, brothers, partners in the gospel. Oh, but trust me, friends. Envy will depress you, and then it will possess you. And ultimately, it will expose you. It will expose precise, precisely which narrative you're living by what the storyline is that's driving your life. Jeanette Cliff George started the AD Players Downtown, a Christian theater some years ago. She's now gone to heaven. But she used to tell the story of a little girl that was, uh, being, uh, that was auditioning for one of her plays. She didn't get cast in the lead role that she had tried out for, but she was given a supporting role, a minor role in the play. Jeanette Cliff George says that during the opening night, that little girl was just off stage watching what was happening as the lead role that she had wanted said the most poignant line in the whole play. And that little girl said just loudly enough for others to hear, that was supposed to have been my line. She was just young enough to speak aloud what the rest of us have gotten savvy enough to learn to try and hide from others. But it won't work. Ultimately, the narrative that's driving you will be exposed. And so we need a better narrative. We need a better storyline. And we have a better storyline. As followers of Jesus, friends, what was the story? What was the narrative? The narrative was, if it's going to be, it's up to you. And you have to do your best. And you have to get ahead. And you have to fill your basket and show God how full your basket was in the end. And maybe, just maybe, he'll say, you know, that's a pretty good basket. I think you're good enough. But the reality is, we'd never be good enough. That's the reality. But instead of banishing us, instead of being done with us, the gospel, the good news, is a story of our great God in whom there was no sin, who loved us, who loved you and me enough to become one of us. And coming to this earth, putting on flesh and blood, he lived the life of sinless perfection that we couldn't live and died the death of punishment that all of us deserved as our stand-in, as our substitute, so that he could conquer the grave on the third day and give our souls a new story, a new narrative. But I wonder, are you living by that narrative? Are you living day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute, reminding yourself, I have a different storyline than he does or she does or those people do? They have to compare themselves to one another because that's the story that they're in. But that's not the story I'm in. I, I stepped out of that story and I stepped into a new story. 
the gospel story. You remember how in the New Testament book of Philippians, the apostle Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. By that, of course, he was not meaning I can fly, I can bend bars of steel, I can see through walls. That's not what he meant when he said I can do things, all things through Christ who strengthens me. He simply meant I can be happy and I can be content in each and every circumstance, no matter how good the circumstances, no matter how bad the circumstances. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And that's the reason for that is because he knew Jesus was with him. He knew it's not so much what's going on around me, it's who I'm with in the midst of what's going on around me. He knew he had the bread of heaven with him that would never leave his soul hungry. He knew that he had life and hope and joy and peace that come through Christ residing inside of us. Paul said, look, I know what it feels like to have a lot to be on the high side of life because I have to have that. And I know what it means to, to be on the low side. as well. I've had a lot of that as well. The secret isn't on whether you're living high or living low. It's not on the accoutrements around. It's not on the circumstances on your life. It has everything and only anything to do with who's with you. And if you have Christ, he will be your all in all. It has to do with whom you're with. The apocryphal story is told of a wealthy merchant during Paul's day who had heard about Apostle Paul and had become so fascinated by all that he was hearing about him that he, he arranged to meet with him when he went through Rome, coordinating with young Timothy, Paul's disciple. He went to have his interview with Paul, the prisoner. Stepping inside the cell, the merchant was surprised to, to find Apostle Paul didn't look anything like he thought he would look. He was old. Physically, he was frail. But it didn't take long before he could feel Paul's strength, his inner fortitude, the magnetism of his spirit. And they talked for some time, and finally the merchant left. And he later told Timothy, never seen anything like it. Paul has this astounding peace and this strength, but he's in prison. Why? Timothy said, did you not figure it out? Paul is in love. The merchant was puzzled. In love? Yes, Paul, Timothy said, is in love with our Savior, Jesus. The merchant said, is that all? Timothy said, oh, that is everything. Paul's secret, the secret to his contentment was that he had subscribed so fully and completely and thoroughly to a different narrative than the narrative I'm afraid drives most all of us and leaves us grasping and grappling in our envy. Oh, friends, we need a new narrative, and he's come to give us one. We need a new song. Our soul is longing for a new song, a song of life and joy and hope and peace. So leading up to the Christmas holidays, I was driving along, and I had my two boys uh, in the car. The younger one, William, was in the front, and he said, why don't you turn on the radio? And so we turned on the radio, and you know how they, the, the stations play the Christmas songs, and so Christmas songs came on, have a holly, and we're listening to the Christmas songs, and... After a few minutes, Wesley, who is the older one, he's sitting in the back and he was studying, but he was distracted by, by, the, by, the, by the singing. And finally, he, he breathed out this, this sort of heavy sigh and he said, would you please turn off the music? I can't study with that music because I want to sing to that music. And in a very real way, the devil would like to get you to turn off the music of the gospel. But deep down your soul is saying, I want to sing to that song. Give me more of that song. Fill my soul more with his word. 
with his promises, with time spent in prayer than you make me be exposed to as you just voyeuristically scroll through hour after hour after hour on social. Let my soul sing a new song. That's the freedom that he came to give us and the freedom I hope you'll seize as we seek to move through these seven deadly sins. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you have a word for us, that you don't leave us held captive in our bondage and our sin, but you provide for us a new narrative, a new story, a new song, good news, hope, something that's different from what the world is offering and different good, different so good and so much better. Lord, forgive us for the time that we spend wasting, looking, comparing, letting the seeds of envy begin to get planted in our souls and listening to the whispers of the enemy who's saying, oh, you'll know you'll never be happy if you don't have that. As long as he has it, especially she has it, then you'll really not be happy. Lord, won't you give us victory? Help us to feel liberated and to step into that new song, that new story, that new narrative that you have for us. Friends, if you're here and you've never said yes to Jesus in the first place, my invitation to you today is to open your heart up to Jesus. You need to start your story with him. And you can do that just simply by opening up your, even as I'm praying aloud, you can pray silently, Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my heart to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me of all unrighteousness, to fill me full of your spirit, and to give me a new story, a new song, new purpose in my life, new meaning. I want to learn what it means to walk with you and to have my heart filled to overflowing that the springs of living water would be bubbling up inside of me rather than going on further with a soul that feels parched and deprived. I want that story. I want that song. And if you're here, friends, and you've prayed that prayer for an initial time, you, many of you, most of you probably have prayed that prayer for an initial time somewhere, but we need to preach it to our souls again and again and again. Even now, say, Lord, remind me. I embraced a new script. I embraced a new song some years ago. Forgive me for slipping back. Put me on track again to track along with you that I may walk in ways that lead to life abundant. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.